Gaming and BS, episode 103. Welcome to Gaming and BS, a tabletop RPG podcast. Sponsored by Gamehole Con, a gaming convention coming to Madison, Wisconsin in November. Get your ass to Gamehole Con. Visit GameholeCon.com for more information. I'm one of your hosts, Sean. And I'm Brett. Welcome to the show, folks. Yes, welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. Glad to have you all here. Announcements. So, oh, well, let's. Whoa, 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 whoa. So Sean and I are one day behind. I was dead ass tired this last weekend because of one of the announcements. Um, evercon.org. I've talked about this before. Let's say every show for a while and you're going to get sick of hearing it. But anyhow, um, we had a big meeting, uh, this last Saturday and I uh, got together with a number of folks who are uh, habitual volunteers for evercon. And they were interested in a lot of the different changes that the team and I have, <clears throat> excuse me, put into place, how we're going to do things a little bit different, how the, uh, the new website working with uh, tabletop events, how that's going uh, with JT and the guys from game crafter who do tabletop events. It's going great. And uh, I think we've got some really cool um, events lined up. We uh, One of the guys local in the area, he's actually an MIB, uh, Man in Black from Steve Jackson Game. He does that, as well as a lot of cons uh, attending and running big organized play, big Savage Worlds guy. So Rich, I hope, is able to uh, – he sounds pretty interested. I think he's going to get in there and uh, pull some one-of-a-kind games out. He hinted at a Lego chariot race, which uh, – yeah, like a miniatures game. I think it should be kind of cool. So anyway, check us out, evercon.org. I hope we guys hope we can see you guys there, men and ladies, uh, in first weekend in January after the new year, of course. Start your new year out right. Come to Evercon, run some games for us, and hang out. It'll be fun. And the game hole, are you coming to game hole? Do you need the Sean Gaming and BS Uber? Sean, what's the deal on that? They just call you and say, "Hey, it's uh, it's like Friday at two in the morning, dude. Can you get me? I'm here now." It is not a drunk. That that's not that's not. We're not drunk calling. No, okay. not a ta- not a drunk taxi cab that way. Although, <laughs> although I mean, I don't want people to. Well, I guess they're not going to be able to drive drunk because they're looking for a car and a ride anyway. Exactly. But anyway, if the, the purpose of it is to get you to the con, by God. Yeah, if you fly in on Thursday, most of the day, in early evening, early, probably prior to midnight on Thursday, um, let me know. Send me an email about a week out to let me know your flight information and the arrival time. And I would be happy to pick you up as long as you don't have a cargo plane full of stuff yes cargo plane full of stuff would not go well but uh let me know i would be more than happy to transport you from airport to hotel Hotel. so and speaking of cons i will be at queen city conquest in two weeks good god that's like uh not this weekend but the weekend after i'll be there hanging out with misdirected mark guys and a bunch of other really cool people um, like the Knights of the Night crew will be there, be seeing those guys. That'll be fun. And um, and then to tie it back, Chris Nizak, word is I've got him. Uh, he's going to be crashing my hotel room for Game Hole Con. <laughs> so, uh, so that should be pretty freaking cool. Get uh, Chris down there, do a little uh, misdirected Mark uh, Gaming and BS mashup here on our home turf. That should be fun. Yeah, he said he was going to run a game under our banner. Yeah, he did. So that'll what, be fun. wonder what it's going to be. <clears throat> Probably something cool, I would assume. Something cool. Something cool, I would assume. That should yeah. be fun. Yeah. Because awesome. we wouldn't want him to run something uncool. Yeah, well, that'd, be, that'd be just stupid now, wouldn't it? Wow. <laughs> I tell you, he, does run, he, runs a, he, he runs a mean game regardless of the game. He's a good GM. So having him here run a game on our batter will be pretty cool. A mean game. I like mean um, games. I know you do. It's mostly, uh, I'll define the word to you later. But anyway, it's, it's good. It fits. Any more announcements, man? Uh, no. Um, no. I don't think okay. so. Well, shall we get on with it then? Yeah, Random Encounter. Random Encounter. Where we're going to field emails, voicemails, comments from social media. We've got a few, uh, a couple longer ones this week. 
you want to start, Brett, or would you like me to read? I will let you start. I think I started last time. I don't quite remember. So anyway, regardless, you start. Michael Phillips on Google Plus comments on episode 99, screw the rules. An over-interest in getting the rules exactly right is deeply problematic. It substitutes mechanical accuracy for the, was it J, I don't know, something that JY for the, I don't know what he's writing there. And wonder, oh. and wonder of the game. I think it's a typo. Well, yeah. Accuracy for the joy. Joy. There, yeah, just missed, the o. there we go. For the joy and wonder of the game. But, uh, quote, but the rules are there for a reason and should be used as written, end quote, is the sort of faffing about that fails to get the whole reason we are doing this. I own Baldur's Gate and Pillars of Eternity for that. Oh, video games. There video, we go. Yeah. Most worrying about things like encumbrance, attunement, etc. is pointless and without impact. It turns out that it is possible to have a meaningful campaign without a careful tracking of the passage of time. Gary was a groundbreaker, though not always right. I'm referring to Mr. Gygax. Fair enough. D&D really needs something like a Dungeon World's Dungeoneering Gear or Gumshoe's Preparedness. The game is supposed to be exciting fantasy adventures, not accurate adventures in accounting. <laughs> nice. Uh, did you catch Sean Merwin's latest podcast where he talks about Merle's discussion of the rules versus play essay? I did not. I'm assuming he's talking about Down With D&D, which is a misdirected Mark production where uh, Sean, the Mad Wizard Merwin, and Mr. Sneezak prattle on with uh, some awesome D&D insights. So I have not heard that one. I am behind on my Down With D&D, but I will check that one out, definitely. Yeah, so he's referring to Mike Merles of Wizards of the Coast. Correct. Um, one of the the overseers of the D&D game. Must have put I, out something <clears> on it. I think Mr. Phillips, his statement, over-interest in getting, getting the rules exactly right, being deeply problematic. I think that's true, right? And perhaps that statement is more succinct as to my uh, usual ramblings, but an over-interest or a uh, making it a bigger deal than has to be type of thing. I think that's kind of... Uh, that's that's true. I, I have met men and women who are obsessively interested in making sure the rules are followed to the letter of the law, as it were, on RPGs, and that just drives me batty. Well, we did have an email that kind of you know said, hey, this is kind of why you want to know the rules. Yes. It's the it, – no, I wouldn't say that what Michael Phillips is saying here is that you don't need to know them or anything, but – over interest, going a little bit too over the top, not allowing for any rulings and that ah. type of thing, which is where I think he's leaning, and I would agree with him there. Gotcha. All right, next up, Mo Tusano comments on Google Plus around episode 102, where Sean and I talked about gaming away from the table. <laughs> and Mo, he's been a little bit behind on us, but he says, oh my God, I actually caught up. Uh, yes, looks like I might be. Nah, you can thank No Man's Sky for helping me get through 300 hours of podcasts and actually be damn near current to the ones I subscribe to. Good Lord, man. Random musings on this episode. Uh, Mo continues with rules. I'm someone who will look up a rule, <clears throat> sort of. What I do is have another player look up the rule and move on to something else at the table. Then check to, check in to see if they have figured out the rule, and if they and if they have, shift focus back to that part of the game. Seldom it happens that the rule actually halts everything that is going on. In that case, yes, we pause while it's looked up. That's when we put a break in play. People grab drinks, use the washroom, go for a smoke, whatever breaks are needed. Every now and then, we just make up a ruling that usually happens <clears throat> when whatever it is that came up, we don't know, uh, we don't know actually impacts the game much. It's not going to really change where the plot is going, then we rule zero. If we, if we do think it will, I always look up the rule after the game and then post it in our group chat so everyone knows the proper rule going forward. I'm a big proponent of running games rules as written. The raw provides two things, raw rules as written. One, a common language that all people at the table share. If we all play by the book, then everyone is speaking the same language. We don't have to worry about strange accents picked up at other game tables. A little smiley face there. <laughs> the rules may be the only thing that any of us have in common at the table. Two, the mechanics of a game system are the physics of the character's world. We make judgments based on the physics of our world. Is it safe to cross, cross the street knowing I walk this fast and that the car is moving that fast? Will I hurt myself if I jump down off this roof? The mechanics simulate those physics allow players to make logical decisions for the characters based on these rules. 
your character would know how hard it may be to grapple that ogre. They would know approximately how far they can jump. They would know how much that fall in the pit trap might hurt. All that is told to them through the physics of the game world, a.k.a. mechanics of the game. That's a very good point. You know, thinking about the, uh, before I go on with the rest of it, thinking of the rules as the uh, physics is interesting, especially when it comes to some of the physical feats of Daring Do that you're allowed to perform. Nice. Metagaming. I already commented on another thread, not something that comes up much in my games. A uh, bit in Amber. I've seen the game, the same problems you guys mentioned. You have to get buy-in from everyone, and that seems really hard to do. The thing with all this time discussion, all these games, all these gaming things take still take time. You aren't going to have any more time. It's not going to take less. What it sounds like it's going to do is split that time. So you won't need five hours on a Monday night to game. You just need five hours some time during the week. I really don't know how I feel about it myself. I don't think I want my gaming in small portions. I'm too big a guy for that. <laughs> Players going to another dimension. I did this with 4 e and d The plot was that the rift between reality and Shadowfell was being torn apart. Got the concept when the players uh, failed to keep on the Shadowfell. Uh, I used this when players weren't present. If a player wasn't there, their character got ripped into the Shadowfell. The next session, they'd show up and they had to uh, tell us a story about what happened to them there. What monsters they faced, what treasures they found. If they did this, they got full XP and magic gear as if they were present for the, for the mission sessions. Side note, when did Cookie get changed back to Monty? <laughs> you get a nasty letter from the man or something? <laughs> Well, um, there's a, yeah, maybe. <laughs> like our lawyers have asked us not to comment on that further, Sean. No that? emails for Monty Cookie. Cookie Monster. Nope. Yeah, not we yet. Gonna, we would be we were, so fortunate. Yeah, we, a cease and desist would at least mean he paid attention to us. That itself would be nice. At least we'd know somebody is reporting us to Monty, which is yeah. not a bad thing. No, it's not. Like I said, a cease and desist would at least be interesting. <laughs> All right, Sean, next one is over to you, sir. Ed emails us, I am interrupting my listening of episode 102 to call BS. That's what we should call this. Like when, when people write in, call us if they want to call BS. Get it? Oh, that and is cool. Another double entendre. Yes. So for, like, for Bob, like over, calling... Bob over at Mr. Merected Mark... That would be like calling bullshit on us. Yes. And calling Brett and Sean. Exactly. At the same time. <gasps> at the same time Body in one statement. Blown. Sorry. <laughs> there are at least three important pieces to this discussion. One is that good story takes time. If it's a group story, it requires time as a group, whether concurrent at the table or serial like play by post while if it's an individual story, can be developed one-on-one, -on -one, either face-to-face -face or via some form of distance communication. Exact same options as for a group story. The second piece is the mechanics. Story fork points can be decided by dice, coin tosses, fiat, discussion, or consulting the old raven in trails. Some mechanics are less involved and can easily be performed on the fly. Again, none of this is related to individual versus group in a deep way, although with a group having an external mechanic like dice helps avoid perceptions of unfairness. Thirdly, the big issue with side story is continuity. This is true whether it's a flashback involving a couple characters or a sidelight that doesn't take place quite in sequence with the main action. When we had a wizard go off to research a spell, if the work wasn't complete in real time, by the time the group, group got back together, we didn't know if he or she had learned the new spell or even survived the quest to pull the toenails off the penguin. What? Well, that, look, I'll tell you this right now. If, if at some point in your gaming career, your character has not pulled the toenails off a penguin, you're gaming wrong. I'm going to tell you that right now. Yeah, let's just say that. <clears throat> We're just going to it has to be out there. So there, boom, said, move on. All right. Either the flashback slash side quest has some rails under it put down by the future storyline or the future storyline has to be open to some retconning. So what's the point here? While formally incorporating these three issues into a game may be new or at least being done in a new way, the issues themselves have existed and been dealt with for decades. Old problems, possibly new solutions. I also have to call BS on one of your offhand remarks. Oh, boy. 
This remark was about 5E's downtime rules and how they are just a mechanic and do, oh. and do not involve story or role-playing. I would argue that almost all rules for almost all RPGs are that. You can run the mechanics to interact with obstacles, or you can use the mechanics to underlie more narratively based encounters, or you can ignore the mechanics and talk through the story. I think we all do all of these at different times in our games. This does not seem to be more or less true for downtime mechanics. If a player wants to have a PC build a stronghold and attract men at arms, people at arms, hench folks, hirelings, it can be as simple as, okay, it'll take this many days and this much gold, or a complete one-on-one adventure that occurs at or away from the group with or without the dice, face-to-face or remotely, can and has for the past 40 years. Now back to my scheduled listening. You're probably going to cover all these things, but this is the sort of timeline issue we just have to deal with when we go off on solo adventures, isn't it? Ooh, Edwin. It's us it's Sh- in the podcast. Cheers from Maine, Edwin. I'll tell you what, Edwin, that is a... a- I will uh, I will accept the BS called on the offhand remark about the downtime rules that uh, flippant quote is just a mechanic unquote is inaccurate. I think you're correct, sir. Um, it can be more than that. Granted, it's it is a tool, it is a piece of the physics of the world that you can use to create story, or you could use to fast track story and have it just be a few die rolls or whatever. I think I was. I think, yeah, yeah, anyway, whatever, I was wrong, quite frankly. I think that uh, what you're saying here, Edwin, makes a hell of a lot more sense to me. So uh, it makes that downtime not just a mechanic for 5e, but is uh, more fodder for a storyline. I like that. That's that's a better way to look at it. Much, much improved. Sean, uh, your thoughts on there? Anything he, Mr. Nagy said? Uh, I'm going to ask Ed if he actually role plays downtime and those events that he outlines. See, is this a counter BS call? Because he says you can run the mechanics to interact with obstacles, right? You can. True. I would argue that almost all rules, right? I have also called BS and or downtime or just a mechanic that do not involve story or role playing. I would argue that almost all rules, blah. So I don't know if he is doing that or if he's just saying you can do that. Oh, if nothing else, if Ed is doing it, it would be cool to see how he's done it. Yes. Right. Right. That he's, is cool. He's yeah. putting out examples, but I don't know if there are examples he's actually done or just thought of. Right. Cool. So and I agree it, with him. Yes. But I will call BS <laughs> and Ed and ask him if he is actually. I mean, because I, while well, I agree, is, I don't know. I mean, it's like you well, going to play downtime. Have, this is the point you and I have talked about before, right? Is are we in that spot where if. The three of us were sitting down at a game hole con, beers in hand, talking about this. Ed would be saying, oh, Brett, no, dude, I called BS on that, man. Blah, And we'd have a nice back and forth. And I'm positive we would be like, oh, yes, click. We'd have an agreement at the end of it. So, again, to his point, we're kind of ping-ponging this one a little bit. But uh, that would be cool, Ed, if you are doing that or if you have some specific examples of how you've done it. That would be really cool to hear them. I would like to hear anybody that is running 5e that – handles downtime other than you are awarded X or Y. What are you during doing during that time? And that's so the it. concept is that it's there. Is anybody actually doing that? Right. Is anyone doing more with it than a simple quote unquote, a simple die roll? Is anyone taking the mechanic and developing story from it? That's your question. Yeah, it is my question. And how deep of interaction is that? Is that more of a, Give me a write-up of a paragraph that you are doing within the next 90 days that your character is doing. Or is it just, hey, DM, I'm going to go and do this. And the DM says, okay, that'll take 30 days of downtime. Okay, sounds good. Boop. Subtract that from your character sheet. Got it. I don't know. I'd be me interested. Either. I'd be interested to hear from the masses. As would I. Thanks for writing so, in, though, Ed. <clears throat> absolutely. I'll tell you, man, our listeners, they're getting sharper and sharper as we go along. One, they um, have always been more than happy to call BS on you and I. But the examples and um, taking a small piece, such an offhanded remark, is it just a mechanic? Taking that and grabbing onto it, there's there's something, there's some power behind that there. So I really like I really like that perspective, Ed. Thank you. Because I think 
I think that there is a line with that because you can say downtime and you're going to role play it out. But then is it really downtime? Because then you're actually, I mean, it is during the time that you are not in the main or whatever that is, but then you're I think that's, turning it I think into that's, an adventure then. I think that's kind of where he's getting is that, you know, depends how you want to cut it. Right. That's interesting. Like, I think, anyway. I think if you role play downtime, then it's just role playing, right? Then it's just, it's just a sidetrack. Yeah. I think that, I think that's where Ed's going. I think that's where he's going. Okay. Cool. Anyway. I don't think, I don't think, I mean, I think our, our, our listeners are becoming sharper. I don't think they're becoming sharper because I think they're always sharp, but I think we're, we're talking about more bullshit and they're like, that's it. I've had it. I've listened to a hundred freaking episodes of these two yahoos. I'm finally going to write an email and vent because I'm so fed up with their crap. That is highly possible. We could have, there could be a, there's a tolerance level that every uh, man and woman listening to us has reached. And at some point, um, we will have a shrieking email from somebody. <laughs> it's a, it's a boiling wanna, point. Yeah, someone will hit the boiling point, and that man or woman will snap on us, which is why we uh, have armed guards at GameholeCon just in case. Right. And we have got something from Joe Swick. Do we have a voice so, message from him or something? Uh, Joe, I got to apologize to Joe on the air because he he sent me a Voxer message, and I said, oh, yeah. He said, let me know if you want to use it on the sh- or if you can use it on the show. And I said, sure. Week goes by, nothing. Week goes by, nothing. Joe sends me a message that says, hey, did you ever mention that on the air? And I go, you dick? <laughs> no, I didn't, actually. And so I'm like, I will. I'll put it in my calendar. So I put it in my calendar and said, okay, I got to mention Joe's Boxer voice, message. audio message. And well, lo and behold, I, it's like, I don't know if it's too far behind. I just can't go back and grab it. So Joe... I let you down, man. <sighs> Joe, just from me to you, I I know that's, I know where you're at. That's how I treat I, our I know. backers. I know I know where you're at, Joe. <sighs> hell, hell, I'm his partner, Joe. You don't want to see what he does to me. It's just not good. Or do you? Well, man, that's that's when we reach 500 on the backer mark. <laughs> Woo! Heyo. <laughs> Anyhow, are we, are we good? Are we good? Let's yeah, do the let's... topic. What are we talking about this week, Brett? So I want to talk about stealing a plot. I got this. Um, I've mentioned this book before, Stealing Cthulhu by Graham Walmsley. Um, I picked it up at Gen Con, one of the last Gen Cons I was at a couple years back. And love it, love it, love it. And I've used ideas and such from before. I'm sure I've mentioned the title on the show before. And I wanted to kind of dig into it a little bit deeper. So you ready, Sean? I am ready. I have not read this book. Well, that's okay. I think once I explain the core of this book to you, you'll be like, "Oh yeah, I like that stuff." Now, this or is not the, this is not the same as squatting. No, it is not. Like if you go out in the middle of nowhere, you claim a plot of land. No, it is not the and same you as that. Squat that would be kind no, of stealing it's not, uh, a plot. Well, that's not stealing. That's using legal. That's using legal precedents to lay claim to something. What? Well, wow. Okay. <laughs> Anyhow, story plot, story plot. I see. So anyway, one of my favorite GM books is Stealing Cthulhu, Graham Walmsley. It's available at drive Through RPG. You can get a PDF. I think it's like 12 bucks. I happen to get a really nice hardcover copy, which is pretty cool. It has uh, little notations on it. Also, I should note by Ken Height, Gareth Hanrahan, and Jason Morningstar contributed to it. Little sidebar notes through the whole thing. And at the very end of it even has a uh, Cthulhu Dark, which is a complete rules light role playing game. So anyway, the core concept behind this, and the thing that really got me thinking about this more was I heard a few people online talking about genre emulation and so forth. And every time I hear that, I'm like, oh, you need to read Graham's book because it totally works for Cthulhu. And I thought, well, fuck, this totally works for everybody. So here we go. The core idea or concept of the book, um, these are, one, you steal an idea directly from Lovecraft, change it, and reuse it. You steal an idea and emphasize something that Lovecraft didn't and reuse that idea. You steal various ideas and combine parts of each, or you take in a Lovecraftian theme and riff on it. So the idea is, for example, if I said, you know what, I really like um, Shadows Over Innsmouth. I like the idea of that whole storyline, <clears throat> the deep ones, the guy goes crazy, um, all this cool stuff, all the imagery and so forth. 
God, but if I run that story, if I use deep ones, everyone's going to know. Everyone's going to understand it. Oh, my God. No, geez, that's not a good fit at all. So it's it's not like earth shattering, like, oh, my God. But take the Migo, these uh, insectoid, bizarre, fungoid like aliens from another planet, from another realm across space and time and replace your deep ones with this other mythos creature. Take the components that would normally be indicative of the deep ones, which are these horrible frog-like fish people, and switch them. So when your characters normally would encounter a horrible fishy smell or a rotten fishy-like odor that you would get from a deep one, in this case using a fungi from Yoggoth, you would have a weird buzzing or clicking sound that would grow louder or dimmer because that's noted from um, uh, from how the, the Migo operates. So if you look at... Shit, I'm forgetting the book. Oh, uh, come back to me. But anyway, um, point is, is that you take one monster and you sub and you just swap it directly for another. And you take that plot then that comes directly from Lovecraft and it becomes new. The Shadow of Rinsmith, <clears throat> excuse me, approach becomes new because the key components of it are different. Right? It's no longer this monster, it's another monster in all aspects of that creature. The other component is when you take an idea that Lovecraft put out there and emphasize it so if the if a certain uh, mythos creature or event had a feature that was given kind of short shrift in the novel take it and expand on it blow that piece out in connection to that well-known thing and it becomes fresh and new again uh, or taking different stories and combining them combine the color out of space with the shadows out of time combine the colors out of space with something else and you can get these really cool mix-ups Okay, so you're thinking, Brett, that's great. I can make my Cthulhu game new. This is sexy. This is cool. The point I'm making here is that when Sean says, I want to run a cool Star Wars game for Game Hole Con. So he decided to do Inglorious Bastards, right? <clears throat> so you took a theme, you took a thing that anybody could look up in Glorious Bastards and kind of get the, the bits, the pieces and so forth, but you've reskinned it to uh, steal a term from uh, from our DCC friends, you've reskinned that storyline, you've reskinned the adventure and put a Star Wars twist on it, which makes that adventure interesting again and new. The familiar tropes are in there or familiar concept or idea, but it becomes new again. And it also helps you emulate the type of event or the story that you're focused on. You following me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Does this make sense to you or does it sound crazy? Yeah, you're just stealing ideas. That's all. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> it's, and honestly, I mean, that is all. The point, though, is that a lot of times, Sean, I think when we're running games, we feel bound like we have to come up with something new, something different. It has oh. to be something no one's ever seen before, you know, and you don't. You can take a very simple thing. And if you want to do Lovecraft stuff right and you say, well, I want to run a Mythos game and I want to emulate Chambers mythology i want to emulate um august derelict's version of the mythology go directly to that source take that story and hack it and again when i read graham walmsley's book i'm like well duh why wouldn't i have thought about this he gives you some nice step-by-step -step ideas how to take the wendigo how to take this component out of uh, lovecraft's mythology and do it and those specific examples just click 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 resonate in my head i'm like oh i can do this for if ever on a western i could take um Unforgiven, and I could make a Western about Unforgiven, but I could twist it just a little bit. It would be fresh and new. The advantage then is for us with, again, limited time. If you know the Magnificent Seven really, really well, and you want to emulate that story, you want to have that thing going, all you have to do is take the Magnificent Seven and turn it a little bit. That's how you get a samurai movie that becomes Star Wars or a samurai approach that becomes the Magnificent Seven. It's a thing that's very, very familiar, but twist it a little bit. And I think, um, especially with Cthulhu, um, a lot of times people want to emulate a thing. They want to have the authentic feeling. And if I was going to run Star Wars, one of my challenges with that IP is how do I make it feel like Star Wars? And there is a shit ton of cartoons and movies and, and comics and all these little storylines out there. Sean, I would think if I told you, hey, I read this comic book, about a Star Wars plot line, but I turned, I, you, instead of it being, you know, 
a bunch of Greedo people, it's now a bunch of Duros. It makes it a little bit different. Change the planet, change a little bit of thing, but all the core concepts, all the things that are in that genre or that setting that everybody wants to have, I can emulate easier by basically stealing directly from it. I think that would be, for me, the best way for me to approach a new genre like a Star Wars because I don't know that sci-fi world as well as you do. Honestly, I don't know sci-fi as well as you do, Sean. I think if I'm going to do it, a better place for me to start instead of trying to create something whole cloth would be to go directly to a type of uh, sci-fi I like and just steal the living shit out of it. Change a few things, but steal directly from it. Yeah? Yeah, I agree. (laughs) Steal that stuff, man. Steal, steal away. So there's the other thing that goes with that is I know... I used to, I I had a thing in my head for a while that I wanted everything to be original. I didn't want anybody to know where I got it from and so forth. And I found that that doesn't matter when it comes to some of those things, as long as they're different enough. And sometimes having it being familiar, especially within a certain genre, helps the players get into that that emulated feeling. Like, oh, I'm playing a gangster game. And they took something from the St. Valentine's Day Massacre film or something along those lines. They're stealing it and they're flipping it around a little bit. But staying true to that entire plot line or the overall components of it really, really helps. And uh, I guess part of me, I'm, like I say, it's not new. We've all done it in some way, shape, or form. But I'm curious as to, do you do this often, Sean? Is it something that when you see a, do you steal directly or do you just steal bits and pieces from stuff you've seen? Right? So you see a movie like, oh, Inglorious Bastards, that'd be really cool. Do you steal the entire plot line? change the names to protect the innocent or do you just take a piece of it? You know what I mean? It's a mashup. So like mashups, usually, usually you may, well, not usually, you may not steal the plot, but you'll steal the character concepts or you'll steal the vibe. So the Force 5 from Alderaan that I'm going to be running is not going to be based on, I mean, if somebody went and watched Inglorious Bastards and sat down at my table, they'll be like, this isn't Inglorious Bastards. I'd say, no, it's not. But I would say that the characters the that I make, the pregens, mm-hmm. are going to incorporate kind of the craziness that is Inglorious Bastards. So it's a crack team. I mean, the, the, I mean, if you were to uh, take a, the movie and my game and put it next to each other. Besides the obvious difference of one being in World War II, Europe, and the other being Star Wars, and the other being Star Wars, the only other thing that they have in common is it's going to be a group of soldiers that are going to be ruthless and out to get revenge upon the bad guys. And in World War II, is the Nazis, and in the Star Wars game, it's going to be the Imperials. So, in this case, then. To go directly to Walmsley's book, it's like you took a theme yeah. and you riffed on it. You took a theme and you riffed on it, which is absolutely a, a perfectly good way to steal. Honestly, I think that's how we started doing it. I always avoided going directly to a plot and lifting a complete story <clears throat> because I'm like, man, if I do this, it's going to, I'm totally, I'm plagiarizing. And I, I have that built into my head that plagiarism is this horrible, nasty thing. I'm, clearly it is. And if you're trying to sell something, but if I'm just doing it as a home game, there's no reason I couldn't do that. There's no reason you couldn't take the entire Inglorious Bastards plot and reuse it, reuse the entire plot line if you wanted to. It's your home game. It really doesn't freaking matter. Yeah, I think you could, but I don't know if I would want to run. I don't well, know. Not just I, not just that movie, but well, that's what I'm saying. I would. I don't know if I would want to run a World War II role playing game called Inglorious Bastards, and then each player character is a character from the movie. And you're going to run them through the movie plot. Now, as kids, we kind of did that when... Well, that's that's one-to-one. What I'm saying is if you took that and changed it... Yeah, sure. In some way, you know, there's components of a story. When you take it and you break it down, you say, well, the first thing that happens in the movie is X. The second thing is Y. Follow the flow of the story, the different story arcs, and then say, well, what would I do with it? Instead of it being this group of people, it's a group of medics. It's a group of somebody else. Or they're not dealing with this particular component from the war they're dealing with this other thing. We can take the major plot pieces of it, the spine of the story, the twists, the turns that come up at different scenes, and you can steal directly from those things and just turn them a little bit. 
Sure. I, I think a lot of Hollywood is kind of that today. Like I don't know if that's a good point. I don't yeah, know if there's an point. original plot coming out of that place, honestly. That's true. I mean, they are manipulating just a piece of it, right? So Chris and, and Phil talk about heist like heist games, heist sessions, about heist around the heist. And they've had a one yep. good episode along around that. And, you know, what is the difference between leverage you know, Ocean's Eleven, the Italian job, and mm-hmm. some of those. And it's kind of like, maybe it's the method, it's the characters, it's the amount of characters. But in the, in the end, it is a heist. There's kind of a common goal. There may be some turns and twists, but, you know, I mean, it's some, some plots or some storylines may be a little bit further apart in their mimicking of each other or maybe they don't even do that but well fair enough that's a good point i think the main the main thing that this drives home to me though is this concept of when you steal ideas there's obviously to me there's no shame in it right as far especially at the gaming table there's no reason not to steal an idea and make it your own there's no reason you couldn't take the entire dragon lance the original dragon lance storyline and say you know what i'm gonna do the world is over and we're gonna rebuild the world i'm gonna do it through this incredibly cool epic component that because my crew, crew signed on to that we're gonna do this big epic storyline you can create familiar stories that are a little bit different there's components of it that they may recognize and say oh it's like that scene when stern brightblade died on the on the castle or this this active thing happens and we we survived but stern didn't okay and the other piece is when you go to the source material that you're looking to emulate you know if you say i really want to want a heist game i don't want to do oceans 11 i really want to do a leverage type of heist don't watch Ocean's 11. Don't dig into Ocean's 11, 12, 13, or however many they've got out there. Look at leverage. Go to the source material and stick with the source. Graham's concept with Stealing Cthulhu was that if you want to make it feel like H.P. Lovecraft, go directly to Lovecraft's stories. Don't go to Chambers. Don't go to the other guys. Go to Lovecraft if you want it to feel like his. If you want it to feel like August Dereleth, go to August Dereleth. Read the source material and come back from it. And... That's where I'm saying, like with Star Wars, if I really want to get the feel for Star Wars, if I was going to run an Edge of the Empire game, I would look at Star Wars canon material in some way, shape, or form. You know, I want to make it be kind of like this particular movie I saw. I want to make it look like uh, part of the cartoon, this one subplot or sub story from one of the Jedi cartoons that my kids was watching. I think that would be cool. If you go directly to the source and use that to model your storyline on, you're going to have a better shot at making sure that the genre, the feel and all the different components that make it the thing is really going to shine through. You see what I'm saying? I think everybody should just watch the seventh samurai and then you're done. <laughs> that would, that's not a bad idea. It's like, <laughs> that's a good movie. There are a lot of movie der- derived from that. Yeah. They magnificent <laughs> sevens. What else? I don't know. There's a few. Yeah, other. no, I get it. But I guess the, if you go directly to that source component of it, and so if you're going to run a, um, when you say Knights Black Agents and someone says, oh, what's that? it's like Jason Bourne versus vampires. Well, go watch a goddamn Bourne movie. Right. Right. Watch the movies in that genre. And then you, or you read Knights Black Agents and say, well, you know, I could also run this in a wilderness of mirrors type of setting. Well, that's more like John Le Carre. Maybe I should watch Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Maybe I should pick up a novel. Um, but if you really want to, from a GM prep perspective, going to the source material, and trying to make sure that you stay true to it from a genre emulation. I guess maybe this is um, stealing the plot specifically for genre emulation is kind of the uh, the stronger line I'm getting at here. Not so much just for cool ideas, but if you really want to make sure that you're staying true to a genre, or you're staying true to a certain type of feeling you want, go to the source. If you want to fuck with it and change it, <clears throat> it's not a he, it's a she. It's not a she, it's a kid. You know, or it's not dogs that are causing the problem. It's bats, it's birds. I did a similar thing with the Trail of Cthulhu game we're running. I took an adventure that was written. I saw it. I went, okay, I like these main spine points, the main overall component of it, but I'm going to flip it and change a little bit. I'm following the main progression from the adventure itself because I think it's very true to the purest um, Lovecraftian type of storyline, but I've changed certain parts of it, but yet I'm maintaining the beat structure, I hope anyway, as I go through it. So when you guys, if I say, oh, it came from this adventure and you were to pick it up and read it, you should be like, oh, I see where he got that from. If at the end of my Star Wars adventure, I said, oh, I got this from 
you know, whatever. Um, fuck, I can't remember all the different cartoons and comics that are out there. I got it from this series. Oh, that's cool. I can see where you lifted that from. But it's, you know, I, I just think going directly to the source like that is just a, the way to do it if you want to get a first crack at it. I think the best uh, example of all this, Brett, is Hanna-Barbera cartoons. Hanna-Barbera cartoons? Oh, yeah. They illuminate me more. Take Take a look at the Flintstones, right? Now, okay, everybody knows Flintstones. Watch Flintstones cartoon. Now watch the Jetsons. It's like the same cartoon. What, and then watch Family Guy. A now, hot redhead and inexplicably attracted to a fat guy. <laughs> yeah, maybe <laughs> modern day. Yeah, well. Yeah. But, I mean, they a lot of their cartoons were similar. They just placed the character. And Scooby-Doo is kind of the same as the, the caveman. What's his name? Captain, Captain Caveman. Caveman. Captain Caveman. Well, no, they, there's that that genre, right, of those teen, of the speed buggy and all the crazy little teen sleuth crews love that were out there. I <clears throat> love speed buggy. <laughs> speed buggy. But it, anyway, I know it's, this is one of those topics that is really interesting to me as to how people, because I'll, I'll play in a Call of Cthulhu game somewhere, I'll read an adventure, go, my God, this is fucking awesome. When I was a kid, I never would go back and read the section and say, oh, this was inspired by, oh, for further reading. I didn't, I, I never paid attention. Ah, author fluff, ah, blah, blah. Who cares where he was inspired from? Well, <laughs> the more I go back and look at this stuff, I'm like, where did this person get it from? Where did Emily Carabas get her idea? Well, she took it directly from this storyline or this idea or this piece is what gave her, gave her some in, inspiration. Where did Ken Hike get his stuff? Well, he's telling me that it's Jason Bourne versus vampires. Going directly to those sources then helps me really understand what it is that the person's trying to do. And I know this is old news to a lot of people out there. They're going to be like, well, no shit, Brett. Had you read the appendix and duh, like Dungeon Crawl Classics tells you, you'd get it. That is true. Not, but not everybody who's played D&D did that. You know, some people did, some people didn't. And the more I've looked at adventures, plot lines or games that I'm like, wow, this is really well done. It really seems to do well. And I'm picking on Knight's Black Agents here because it's the first that comes to my mind is Ken Height is well known for being like the research guy. He did his time and went in and figured out how, you know, what, what source material worked for what he wanted to do. You look at Robin Laws of Feng Shui too. All, all he did with that, the sheer volume of research and stuff that he did. That's a shit ton of stuff. He's creating something essentially whole cloth and a complete game. I heard, I heard Robin good. actually did training as a stuntman in action movies in Canada <laughs> yeah. to should, research. That's a, that's a good rumor to start. We're going to keep that going. To research um, Feng Shui. Like, yes, yes. how could he possibly write the role-playing book without having that experience? Yeah, exactly. He he uh, he helped teach Chow Young fat It was pretty cool. I think he's part of the CIA, actually, but I that's just me. Is. Yeah. Anyway... Um, those men and women are writing complete games, so they have to do tons and tons of work. And I'm not saying to go out and do that, but if you want to run a really good Cthulhu game, if you're like, I really want to run a game that emulates like an HP Lovecraft thing, pick up Pikmin's model, read it. Instead of it being ghouls, change it to being some other Lovecraftian monster. Change it to being deep ones. <clears throat> and suddenly, all the different bits and pieces in there flip a little bit. It starts out a little bit different. Instead of it starting with this an artist in this town it begins with a musician in this other town the musician hears a strange piping noise and turns into this it turns into that it's following the exact plot line the spine the beats all the components of the story are still there you simply change the cast and you change the monster and um you begin to emulate a really cool a uh, lovecraft based cthulhu creature a cthulhu adventure or story i should say if you want to run a game like you know what i really like to run a big D, D city game kind of like you know the old um thieves world stuff go read some thieves world books check them out read a couple of the short stories you'll get and you'll get the idea or watch the the movie that you want to emulate or whatever and then if you want if you're stuck saying i love the theme i love the feel i just don't know how to make it into a game there's a plot line right there in front of you it's directly from lovecraft it's directly from this other author steal it directly Pick the entire goddamn plot, pick it out, break it down into component parts that you think, well, if I was going to run it, I would do this. Great. Now go back through, find, replace, deep one with Fungi from Yogoth. Done. And, and, just, then, and then publish it and put it out and in your name. And publish it and pretend it's your own. Yes, that's what you do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what you do. 
And tell him Sean told you it's fine. And he's got the lawyer fees to help support you. Yeah, totally illegal. <laughs> but you know what, but Brett? It, it, it's it, a that, weird. It's sorry. Go, go, go ahead. No, no, no. I was I was wrong, going on top of you there. Your turn. But so the the. the uh, it depends on how you run this in a game, though, because I know somebody's going to be like, I call BS. Right. And I encourage you, listener, to call BS because that's what you do. That's what you do. But somebody out there is going to be like, that's BS, because if you get it too close to the story and you steal too much of it, then you're playing that story. So then what's the point? Right. That's the big argument about playing Star Wars. I don't want to play Star Wars. It's already the movies. I don't want to play the movies. It's already canon it's already put in place yada yada so yeah i think uh, a lovecraft story doesn't have the same issue because there's not a series of movies that are canon they got books yeah there are but if you retell a certain story with the fungi from yogoth instead of deep ones or you use uh, ghouls instead of deep ones and sometimes the uh do, so to me I guess you can have a naysayer in that, in that camp. The idea is that, well, you're in the movie now. You're in the story. What would you do? Well, I never would have done that. Okay, don't do that, and we'll see what happens. Because the players are going to do whatever the fuck they want anyway. Well, that's another, idea, that's another argument, too, is when you do that and mm-hmm. they catch on to it or they don't catch on to it and you are – because I think part of me is like, okay, you read the book, watch the movie, whatever it is. You say, oh, I'm going to do that. It changes, yep. you know, subtle nuances, the races, the the characters are different. Well, some uh, of that's not subtle. Some of that's big, whole cloth change. Well, I guess that's the point, right? How much is it that you are going to change so that it's not blatantly obvious? Mm-hmm. And then, because to me, you could be setting up more of a railroad than I would actually run. Ooh, I see where you're going. Ah, uh, see? So you're like, oh, yeah, okay, whatever. Well, it, to me, the advantage then is that what happens is so instead of it being a seaside town, it's an industrial complex. Okay. Okay, it's an industrial complex. Sure. And instead of it being this creature, it's this other creature, which behaves a little bit different. I just need to – I'm working with those components of it. By changing the location, and again, the players are going to do different things. So if you were actually playing the Shadow of Rensmith or the Colorado space or Pikmin's model. No doubt your player characters would do something different than the characters in the book would. And that's totally fine. The idea is the overall concept of what the creatures are trying to do or what their overall goal is in that case. Or um, if you pick a different genre, like a heist is that someone's not going to run the, uh, the, um, Oh, shit, the Ocean's Eleven plot, exactly the same. Someone's going to go, I don't like that idea. I want to do this other thing. I don't want to use a muscle guy to pretend to beat up o- Danny Ocean. I want to try to do this other thing and fast talk my way instead of doing this. This I want to try to break through security. That's fine. The idea is that what stealing these plots and stealing these ideas um, has given you things that can, has given you a concept around NPCs, monsters, creatures, traps, tricks, all these different beats and so forth. The players are going to skip willy nilly through your well-crafted plot and do whatever the fuck they want anyway, which is totally fine. But now you have an idea of what everything in that storyline would be doing. Hey, look, the deep ones are here. Their whole idea is to um, create deep one hybrids, take over this thing and maintain a secret. Okay. Flip that fungi over Yogoth are here so they can rip people's brains out, stick them in jars and fly them over to the planet Pluto. That's their job. Okay. So there's still secrets. There's still horrible things being done to people, and they're still going to try to make sure that nobody finds out about it and gets out alive. So that main goal is maintain my secret. No one gets out of here alive and make sure there's no interruption to the you know brain ripping out uh, assembly line that we have going or whatever it is that they've got. It's just it's a similar piece. How when the players interact with it, when they smash up against it, I try to break it or dismantle it or win. Um, the bad guys, the monsters are going to react a certain way and it's going to be pell-mell and craziness, but it kind of gets you going. You know what I'm saying? It's not, you're not railroading them to the very end say, well, the story ends like this and there's no way. I'm sorry. I am your father, Luke. And that's just how it goes. Ha 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 ha. No, you don't have to do that. You could play through that entire plot line and Luke never finds out that Darth Vader's his father because you flipped it and they didn't go that direction. Spoilers. Spoilers. (laughs) Does that make sense? 
it does make sense, and I do agree with you, but I do think that with that approach, you have to be conscious of one railroading because you're maybe you're it depends on what pieces of the story you're taking. So if you're taking That's a good the, point. If you're taking the plot mm-hmm. and you're wanting the characters and you're conveying a particular story in front of them, then you have that kind of in your brain. You're like, oh, I read this book. This would be awesome to run as a game. Yep. You you can run in danger of I must fulfill my prophecy because I have written the prophecy, therefore it must be fulfilled. That's exactly right. Like, oh <clears throat> it's a yeah. you know, and that so you have to be careful with that. Because wow, they're not going the way I want them to in the like they did in the cool book, and they, it was really cool, and they're not being really cool. Yeah, I also think that there is something to be said about you said you know you never want to kind of divulge your inspiration or you want to keep it on the down low because you don't want people to pick it up, which I agree with because the minute somebody goes oh because they never realize it at at first they'd be like oh. Oh, it's this a buddy of oh, mine. It's, Pikmin, it's Pikmin's model. There's ghouls in a basement. Right. I get it. A friend of mine ran a Star Trek game. We investigated a an abandoned starship. Went on there. I had never seen the show this was taken from, but it was a Doctor Who episode where there was this creature kind of wandering around and it would be whispering to us and we could never see it or touch it. And I can't remember what, what it was. And then there was a little kid in it. Of course, kids are creepy. And uh, which is why Sean's not allowed shutter. to have any, right? <laughs> oh, the kids, kids are creepy, and yeah, my house is scary, terrifying to Sean. He's never been <laughs> as long as we have a mutual understanding, exactly. Um, and then somebody's like, Oh, I know that's from that's from that episode of Doctor Who. To me, it was foreign because I had not watched it and seen it. And so, piece, pieces of that have to be kind of taken. <clears throat> into consideration they have to be on the down low absolutely that's why i like mashups right there's a point of reference but it's not like hey you know carl keesler runs a bunch of mashups goonies and ghostbusters correct you know what goonies are you know who the ghostbusters are they're two great tastes that go great together i'm guessing that the 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 adventure that he runs is not the uh whatever the bad people in the goonies is i can't remember the no, I know I mean, the 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 bad guys, the guys that have been shot. The at family, the thieves, the right? Yeah. yeah, the family. And then you know, I'm sure the Marsh Stay Puff Marshmallow Man, if he makes an appearance, is mm-hmm. probably kind of a cameo than anything. True. Right. Well, I'll tell you, let me. I'm going to. I've got this. Uh, the contents here from Walmsley's book. I just want to call it a couple pieces because I think he lay the way he lays this out. He breaks it out into a couple different components. Like if you're going to steal the scenarios, yeah, you can steal beginnings, sure. set pieces. Details, backstory, viewpoints, locations, creatures, talks about shifting timing, stealing endings, as opposed to necessarily stealing the beginning. You could just steal an ending if you're if you're needing one. You can steal themes, um, different locations, characters, patterns, the way that they um, Lovecraft would do increasing horror, the way distance would be would be met, um, reprisals, increasing that type of thing. So, Sean, I think what you're going for What I'm going I, for is if you use if you do all of them. Yeah, if you do too much, right? If that's it is a direct <laughs> rip. So true. Okay. Does, does I think, he talk I think about that's... does he talk about like, hey, if you're gonna do this, limit yourself to Yep. He when you go through it, it he talks about, hey, steal this component of it, work with it and go. Right. Steal this other piece, work with it and go. And the concept of the mashup, he doesn't use that phrase, but that's totally legit, right? You say, Look, I really like this component from this story and this other component from this Lovecraft story. If I smash them together you know, a brand new monster or a similar monster. And I'm going to steal this beginning from shadows at a time. I'm going to take this ending from Pikmin's model and Hey, I can do this really cool thing. Then it becomes, you've made something you've made essentially a well-connected components that are all kind of tied, ticked and so forth together, but you don't have the same feeling of, well, I'm running Pikmin's model. I hope to God they get there. I'm running, um, you know, Star Wars episode, whatever. And I hope to God they get to the end because it better be Luke. I'm your father. Otherwise this, this game didn't go well. That helps to stop um, the railroading piece. When I read through Graham's advice, I'd never felt like it was going for a, Hey, do this directly. Right. So I shouldn't say that. So he's saying steal things directly, but the twist, the concepts are there to steal components of it. Um, 
steal this location, steal this theme. You're taking all the different pieces of it. You're twisting all of them a little bit, replacing and changing and modifying, but you still have all of the components that are Lovecraft. You have the way he does horror, the way he does escalating reprisals from the bad guys. You have the way he does a mysterious stranger in the woods. You have the way he does this weird location. You have all those pieces. He took them from different stories because you know your source material, and then you mapped them together, and now you have a story. Does that make sense? It does, but I still think you got to be conscious of saying, okay, I'm going to take the end of this and this and this piece of that. And if it, because I think a part of it is I'm in a, a player character. I'm going to play in your adventure. You're going to lay out certain things in front of me and I'm going to make choices. And if I feel yep. as though those choices aren't going to impact what you are further going to convey to me. So what I do is go this way. And if, if Brett doesn't make it sound like, okay, that's great sounds good and it leads me to believe that my choice has doesn't a, matter doesn't matter then that's a problem but if you make it sound like hey you yeah. can go that route it doesn't mess up everything else that i have because i didn't pick the ending of this book because the players are going to create that for themselves then i think yes. it's it's kosher and i think we're saying that but i just want to make no, you're sure right. it's it's delivery it's delivery it's, delivery. it's actually a delivery right if you do a thing be prepared. Your player's going to run rush shot over it. If you try to create an adventure whole cloth, you just steal nothing. You try to create your own um, Star Wars race, your own Star Wars planet, your own Star Wars everything, and try to do everything yourself, and you're trying to emulate Star Wars in some way, and you build it all yourself, it's this great thing. <clears throat> Whatever you create for your homegrown adventure, you still need to be con conscious of that, where it's the agency piece, right? Where the players perceive their decisions have no value or merit or worth and have no impact. That's bad. So I guess what I'm saying is that I love the book. So that's cool. I've said that a bunch of times, but the neat thing is that from an inspiration perspective, it made me look at all the different things when I've said, God, I really wish I could emulate this sci-fi thing better. I'm like, well, I can totally do that. I just fucking steal directly from the source. Why am I not doing that? Why do I have to create it all brand new? I can take the source. I could take the actual honest to God storyline and take the beats and the overall approach, the structure to it, how they structured the story for Ocean's Eleven. And I can do that. I just have to change up certain pieces of it so that way the players can do whatever they want, uh, make sure that their choices matter, all those good other DM tricks tricks and tips and, and uh, things that we live by. But at least this way I have an idea of what's supposed to happen, right? I'm not going in completely blind. I know the general concepts, and it just helps me um, put together my adventure better and emulate the specific genre that I'm thinking about. Fair? Yeah, man. Okay. All right. If you feel as though you want to call BS, drop us an email or a comment on social media and let us know. I'd be interested. Absolutely. I would be interested to find out um, if you're stealing stuff. Yeah. Tell us what you, <laughs> tell us what you've stolen. It's kind of a confessional. That's right. I honestly, I mean, honestly, I've stolen a lot of different of my Cthulhu ideas. I don't want to testify, for, Brad. For, for horror thing, you don't want to testify? Well, too bad. I'm going to tell you stuff right now. I've stolen haunted house scenarios from different movies or books I've read. I've stolen lots of different components and uh, taken the high-level pieces of it and flipped it. And a lot of it I started doing more and more of recently after I read Graham's book and went, oh, you know what? That's totally legit, man. Here's a way I could do this thing and maintain the vibe I want. So I think it's good stuff. I want to see, as you said, or hear what other people have to say. I do agree. I do see the value in it. All right. Absolutely. That's all I wanted. <laughs> That's all I wanted. I just want you to value me. Let's get into die roll. We got a lot, man. Running long. Don't check your watch. Die roll. Two to four, or six or eight miscellaneous points of gaming and geekery. Brett, you you came up with some, Brett. Probably I did. Did, I got, <laughs> I've got four. We can't do math, so this is going to be high. Um, so SETI is investigating some space signals. This is kind of cool. Um, it's one of those pieces that, of course, you know, investigate mysterious extraterrestrial signal from deep space star system. Go out there, link in the show notes. Uh, SETI is a search for extraterrestrial intelligence uh, program. It spent decades scanning the heavens for potential alien signs, and uh, looks like they may have picked something up. We'll see what it actually turns into, but pretty cool. I think pretty they're cool. amongst us, so I think they're just jamming SETI signals and manipulating them so they're not discovered here on Earth fucking reptoids just saying um 
The other one I had was the Mars mission crew had a year long simulation that they just came out of uh, that they ran in Hawaii. So I think they packed like five people in this year long simulation of to what it would be like isolated on the planet Mars. And apparently all five people walked out alive with minimal uh, injuries to each other. Whoa. Physical injuries, <laughs> maybe. I don't know about the emotional the trauma. <laughs> yeah. I think it's more mental than anything. It's interesting. Um, that was one of the pieces when you hear about the the Mars mission type of concept. You're like, what the fuck? I, would you go crazy? You know, I, I don't know how you can simulate that. And uh, the reality of being that far from a thing. I don't know. But anyway, interesting stuff. Um, a sad note. Gene Wilder has passed. Um, one of my favorite actors from that time, the Willy Wonka guy, the Blazing Saddles guy. He's done so many, so many amazing, cool things. Young uh, Frankenstein. Young, Frank, young Frankenstein, exactly. So that kind of sucks. 83, apparently uh, died of Alzheimer's from what I uh, read. But to uh, wrap up my bit on a happier note, the Cypher Speak podcast, it's a new podcast on the misdirected Mark piece. I picked up the Cypher System rulebook kind of in a bit of serendipity, grabbed it, been interested in it for a while, got it. I'm like, oh, I should start reading this. And then I start seeing stuff in my feed from the guys at Mr. Director Mark saying, hey, we got a new podcast. It's all about Cypher. I'm like, well, fucking hey, I'm totally in on this. So they had their uh, episode zero um, not that long ago where they kind of introduced themselves and so forth. This one is their first real episode where they dive into the GM intrusions. It was kind of fun. It's a short form podcast, but it's uh, it's well done. Very articulate people, much more organized than Sean and I. So if you uh, prefer organization, you uh, might want to check those folks out. For calling that out. Sean, I will pass it over to you, sir. All right. I got one, two, three, four, five, six. I got eight. Eight. Damn. A lot of busy week. Busy week. First one, Dungeon Robber. Online solo dungeon crawl game. Check this it. This is that that looked pretty cool. I saw somebody else posted that up. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. Yeah, check it out. Only one way to experience. You gotta click on it. Exactly. Swords and Wizardry Light announced on Tanker's blog. Tanker, one of the supporters of the show. Thanks, Tanker. Yes, um, absolutely. So he announced it. I couldn't find a link to the folks at Frog God that publish Swords and Wizardry Light. That'll be coming, though, is my understanding. I believe the PDF may be free. Then you may be able to pick up a printed version at some point. It's going to be streamlined. Uh, so a lot of people that are Swords and Wizardry fans will appreciate that even more. Number three, six reasons why I'm studying female tabletop gamers. So this is a blog entry. If you are a female tabletop gamer, um, the woman that wrote this blog entry kind of stated her case, and then it is actually soliciting uh, feedback from female tabletop gamers. So if you are and you want to contribute to her research um, by all means head over to the link in the show and if you are not a female gamer but you do know somebody that is female gamer and does not listen to our show let them know about this so we can absolutely help, help her gather as much info as she can um, from those that she she is collecting info on that's very cool mellow dice uh, this is a music for board games. Props to Mr. Wayne Lumrunner Humphrey, another patron of the show. Uh, Mellow Dice literally is like you go there and you it's a, a, like literally a text box on a white page. You put in the board game, and I think it does a query of playlists from YouTube. So I put in Lords of Waterdeep, and first thing it starts out with is a music uh, song from like the D&D &D soundtrack or something. Not the movie, but like the no, actual it, game. If you type that in, it gave me Guild Wars right out of the gate. Yeah. But yeah, dude, that's kind of cool. <laughs> so if you're playing board games and you want some background ambiance, just pull up this it, website and crank the speakers just a little bit. I just did it. It's pretty cool. That's very nice. Uh, Where am I? I'm on number... You know, one, two, three, you're on map to the D&D. &D. Yeah, map of the Dungeons & Dragons 2E Multiverse version 2.0. This is by Mick Mag... Nanimous on DeviantArt, um, which is kind of a cool concept art he had done before. I guess it could be she too. Um, they put it together and came out with version two. It's basically the outer planes, inner planes, I think prime material plane probably, but it's kind of a neat map piece of art thing that's out yeah, there. Two, 2E was like, you know, the whole uh, spelljammer uh, planescape, that whole bit too. So cool stuff. 
Uh, next one, Dave Rumsey Map Collection. Um, link in the show notes. 71,000 maps online going, bar- going back as far as the 1600s. Oh, very nice. Uh, thanks to the Frugal GM that posted it on their blog to Dave Rumsey's Map Collection. So if you are running a game where you wanted some old-looking maps, I imagine they're from this world, but nonetheless uh, may give you some um, creative incentives, inspiration. Very cool. If not, maps are always good to have. Free PDF Exploration Time Tracker, which is by posted by New, Dra- New Big Dragon on Save versus Dragon blog. This is just a... So the inspiration behind this is the individual who made this, the New Big Dragon, I think is a developer or something and needed to keep track of their time. And they put this into the game world where you can download it and it's got some little graphics that you can keep track of time and resources now. This person admits that they are running a game that is going to be more resource intensive. So, want to use a torch? Great. They're going to keep track of that. Um, so, if you want to make it a little bit more realistic as far as what are you carrying? Great. Um, when you run out of torches, you do not have any light source. What do you do? So, it's kind Interesting. of Interesting. Yep. Well, one of the hard parts about the resource is the bookkeeping, right? And this is essentially a ready-made bookkeeping sheet for you. Correct. A simple checks and balances there. Nice, nice. Last one, Raphael Chandler, linked to his profile on Google+, Plus, uh, got creative and did a mashup between uh, what would I would consider Cosmopolitan or uh, Gentleman's Quarterly or GQ um, and crossed that with like Dragon and called it Grognard. And so they look like modern magazines that you would see on the newsstand and then just p- manipulated the headlines into D&D and... OSR and role playing game oriented stuff. And he did a nice. pretty good pretty good job. It's on Imager. Um and it's making I mean a lot of shares going around on Google Plus, but if you haven't checked it out, by all means do that. Very cool. We did get one from the Mongrel. Pure Mongrel passed us to uh, fantasy maps drawn by bots. Uh there's a fantasy novel inspired Twitter bot. It was and is now generating a new map of fictional lands every hour. Link in the show notes. Uh it's just more cool stuff. These are these are always fun. Even if you take the names and trash them, but just keep the uh, the backgrounds and just the the shorelines and all that stuff. Uh, it's it's cool. That's some more. Again, maps are always super handy when you're building stuff. So here's my thought. Mm-hmm. So the bot is going to start out creating maps. Then there's going to be another bot that does SketchUp. So are you familiar with SketchUp, Brett? No, I'm not. SketchUp was a I think it's still an app that you can get out there. I thought that they were bought by Google at one point, but basically you could take a 2D thing and you sketch up and it'll turn it into 3D. Oh, okay. Right? So you kind of draw it out in 2D and then you in SketchUp you kind of trace it and it'll you know render it into three dimensional. So that's what's gonna happen with another bot. And then another bot's gonna take that and they're gonna it's gonna print it out. Okay. And then once they start realizing that the world is more than just maps, they're going to start creating machines and robots, and then they're going to conquer us and kill us. Skynet. Hey, man. Or they'll create maps that are the scale is one inch equals one inch, and they'll just lay a big-ass map on top of us all, and we'll die. You heard it here first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm telling you. Brett laughs. I, I, oh, I, Serious I laugh shit, I Brett. Don't cry. That's, that's the problem. All right. Brett, that, that's the show. If uh, we could ask uh, this awesome listener that we are that is tuned in, uh, that they could do us a favor, what would it be? It would be tell someone about the show. Um, we'd like to, I mean, the, the coolest thing that's happened to us is that now at 103 episodes, a lot of people have listened to us. We're, I'm positive we're getting new listeners based on the type of feedback and different people coming back to us. And uh, it's really cool. So pass the word. Get other people uh, checking us out. Yeah, they might not like it. They might go, ah, those two idiots. It's not our thing. But hey, somebody out there is going to be just as weird as the rest of us. And they'll be more than happy to tune in and listen to us. And uh, then they'll get in. They'll start interacting with the rest of the listenership. And it'll be uh, it'll be cool. Tell more people. So uh, next week, what are we talking about, Brett? Well, it's going to be September. So I want to go through the RPG A Day lightning round. 
I stole that a little bit from uh, Ken Robin there. But we'll go through the RPG a day list, and uh, Sean and I will try to do a quick back and forth through the hour and see if we can get through the whole damn list. See what we can do. All right. Well, that's a uh, an episode of Gaming and BS. Thanks for tuning in. tuning in. I'm one of your hosts, Sean, and I'm Brett. Good night. Good gaming all. Gaming and BS produced with the help from the following patrons: Christian Sexy Voice Serrano, Kevin Lovecraft, Joe Swick, Brett's biggest fan, Steve Day, Jeff Rademacher, Boris DeGary, Mark Anthony Benedetti, Bruce Cunnington, Eric Jeppesen, Andy Hall, Misdirected Mark Productions, Sean Nicholson, Tim Jensen, Chris Steele. Old School DM, Knights of the Night Crew, Palladian, Jason the Beard Blaylock, Remy Billado, Jason Hobbs Hobbs, Merkel Froelich, Wayne Lumrunner Humfleet, James Carpio, Not Caprio, Mark Tasaka, Tony Baker, Not So Pure Mongrel, Lord Tentacle, Brett Pazinski, Corey Johnston, Tim Shorts, Eric Tankar, and Brandon Barnes. Consider becoming a patron. For the cost of a coffee shop coffee, you can support the show for an entire month. Whoa.